Hello everyone and welcome to the Plant-Based Diet. My name is Caitlin Hennessy. I'm the Program Coordinator here at Global Connections. And our goal at Global Connections is to provide engaging co- and extracurricular activities for global campus students anywhere they have an internet connection. And we're delighted that you joined us this evening. Presenting tonight's program will be Alice Ma. She is a registered dietitian here at WSU Dining Services. And throughout the evening, as many of you are already doing, please do use that chat box to discuss content. You can submit questions for Alice at any point. She will be breaking for a formal Q&A a few times during the presentation, but I'll be sure to take note of your question no matter when you post it. And if you have any technical difficulties, please do let me know and I'll do my best to help you. I will be your events moderator in the chat throughout the evening. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Alice now. Thank you for coming. Today we're going to talk about the plant-based diet. Um, I'm very excited to present. It's my second webinar through the Global Campus Program. Uh, the first one I did back in October, and this topic particularly is something uh, that I'm very passionate about, so I'm excited to share that all with you. Um, so just a little bit about me at first. Uh, my name's Alice. Uh, I'm a registered dietitian. So what that credential means is that I've gone through um, an accredited program, um, a master's program, and completed a number of internship hours, and as well as taken an exam to become a uh, registered dietitian. So um, uh, unlike the word to term nutritionist, that, the term nutritionist doesn't really have that same regulation or requirements in this country. And so the preferred term is registered dietitian. Uh, I am. I grew up in West Jordan, Utah, uh, close to Salt Lake City, uh, and so I ended up going to the University of Utah for my undergrad and then um, my master's in nutrition and dietetics, uh, and then uh, spent about a year over in central Washington, then moved over here in 2015, and I currently work for uh, dining services here at Wazoo as their dietitian, and most of what I do uh, revolves around um, menu planning, recipe development, um, working with students with special dietary needs. And one of the, the uh, biggest trends we've seen in the past couple of years is the request for more plant-based options in the dining centers, uh, either from students who are fully vegetarian or vegan or students who generally just want to eat less meat. And so this is a topic uh, I'm very familiar with. Um, I personally have also been plant-based. Um, I call myself vegan for about a little over three years now. Uh, so this is a topic I love. So just a little overview of what um, I'm going to talk about today uh, and share with you all today is why eat plant-based. So uh, the whys and the what's, the definition of plant-based and why many people are going plant-based for a number of reasons. Uh, and then secondly, I'm going to address some common myths and concerns when it comes to getting enough nutrition on a plant-based diet, specifically with uh, the first question you often hear when you tell people you're vegetarian or vegan. Um, uh, is how much protein you get. And then uh, my favorite part will be talking about cooking techniques and giving you a lot of recipe ideas and references, uh, blogs to find your own recipes uh, on how to replace uh, protein, how to replace eggs and, and milk, and still come up with uh, delicious food at the end. And I've got a lot of pictures that I've taken of the food I've eaten both in the dining centers as well as food I've made at home. Uh, so lots of great pictures. And then I'll, uh, because there's a lot of things to cover, I'll also uh, bring in some additional resources for uh, nutrition information, um, recipe blogs, and then we'll do questions throughout as well as have some time at the end for questions. So let's start with the definition of plant-based diet. What does the word plant-based mean? And there really isn't a standard definition that, that I found online. Um, it's sort of one of those things where you interpret it on your own uh, based on what your philosophy is and uh, what your definition of a healthy diet is. Uh, I pulled a few uh, from the internet. Um, Caitlin, if she can, we'll pl uh, plug in the links for those. The first one is from a blog called The Happy Herbivore. A uh, great blog if you ever, I see some people have read it before, but great blog for recipes as well as just general information on going plant-based. But a person, uh, according to her, a person following a plant-based diet eats only plant foods, but you'll see in parentheses, she also mentioned, or mostly plant foods. So it's not really necessarily an all or nothing thing. It's basically uh, most of the, your diet is plant-based, but you know, maybe occasionally you'll eat meat or dairy, maybe on vacation, maybe uh, on holidays. 
um, it's a little bit flexible in that way. So it's more of a spectrum as opposed to a black and white thing. And there's definitely some gray area there. Uh, second definition, uh, this is more, a little bit more specific to the health aspect of it. Uh, it's from the Huffington Post. Um, and they refer to it as a whole foods plant-based diet. So as opposed to a, just a plant-based diet, one that's based on whole foods is just that. Uh, it's based on foods that are in their whole form as opposed to foods that are highly uh, processed or plant parts. Uh, and the emphasis is on health. So eating whole fruits and vegetables, lots of whole grains, uh, staying away from animal products. And they also put, again, in parentheses, or at least minimizing. So again, it's uh, there's a gray area. It's not completely black and white all or nothing. Uh, there's some room for flexibility there. Uh, and then one question I often get is uh, whether it's that same plant-based diet is the same as being vegan. And in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. It really depends on who you ask and what their personal philosophy is. Uh, with the term plant-based, that really applies to just diet for the most part, so what you're eating, uh, whereas veganism is really much more of a philosophy uh, surrounded, uh, 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 focused on uh, animals. Uh, so someone who's vegan may follow a mostly plant-based diet, um, but they also maybe will avoid buying leather. Um, they may avoid honey and gelatin. Uh, they may purchase special shampoos or conditioners that don't uh, from companies that don't test on animals. And so um, it's similar to being vegan, but they're not always interchangeable in some ways. Uh, and this picture is an example of that, uh, illustrating that point. So this is a uh, cinnamon roll that I got back in Salt Lake City from a vegan uh, cinnamon roll place that just opened up uh, back home. And they use these cookies, which are uh, essentially vegan uh, because there are no animal products, but they're definitely not whole foods plant-based because a lot of the ingredients in there are synthetically made. So they're not necessarily healthy, but they are still vegan because there are no animal products. And then lastly, some people also use the term flexitarian or reducitarian, um, and that's kind of the same idea as plant-based, but a little bit more flexibility there. So um, they may eat plant-based most days of the week uh, and have a little bit of room and flexibility for restaurants or on holidays. Uh, another term that's used sometimes is called re reducitarian. Same concept, uh, plant-based, but not necessarily black and white, fully vegan um, or vegetarian. So why are people uh, plant-based or eating less meat? And there are a number of benefits. Uh, and so there's no right or wrong reason to do it. It's uh, really, if you're doing it, uh, you'll see all these benefits. So first and foremost, um, we use the term plant-based because it's centered around health. And so with the health aspect of it, uh, generally speaking, a plant-based diet is going to be higher in fiber um, because you're most likely eating a lot more fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, uh, nuts, grains, and then also lower in saturated fat because um, a lot of the saturated fat in our diet comes from meat. And so just by eliminating meat, uh, you're eliminating a lot of saturated fat. And then lastly, um, there's no cholesterol in a 100% plant-based diet because cholesterol only comes from animal products. So when you're completely plant-based, you're not consuming any cholesterol at all. And then as far as uh, studies go, uh, there are several studies on plant-based diets and vegetarian vegan diets and uh, the health outcomes of those. And generally speaking, uh, people who are on a plant-based diet reduce their risk of diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure um, as well as uh, use this diet as a means to manage uh, those if they already have these conditions existing. Um, and the key thing with this to remember is people who are even partially vegetarian or vegan or partially plant-based, maybe two or three days of the week, also see those same benefits. Um, it's a little bit, the benefits uh, increase as you go more plant-based, but even if you are, you know, flexitarian or plant-based uh, a couple of days of the week, you will see some improvements there according to this research. Secondly, we have the environment. And so I won't touch too much on this, uh, but this is really the reason I became plant-based. I'm more of a flexitarian in the first place about six years ago uh, before becoming fully vegan about three years ago. And so uh, there are a number of reasons why being plant-based is a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit better for the environment. Um, one is greenhouse gas emissions. So um, Beef production especially results in a high amount of greenhouse gas, especially a methane emission into the air, uh, as well as require a lot of usage of water and land, a lot of natural resources compared to, you know, beans, lentils, and other things like that that require much fewer resources, 
uh, emit very little uh, greenhouse gas. Um, and we do things like, uh, you know, we talk about sh cutting showers sh uh, shorter or like driving less, using our bike more. And those things do have a positive impact on our environment, but the um, biggest impact is going to be come from our diet. Uh, next, it's a pretty easy one, our, our wallets. So um, some people eat less meat just to save money, and that's a very simple way to do it. Uh, there are ways, you know, where if you purchase a lot of plant-based cheese substitutes or meat substitutes, those can cost a little bit more. But generally speaking, if you're buying things like beans, lentils, peanut butter, uh, and resorting to those things as your primary source of protein and pl uh, plant-based substitutes, uh, because you can buy a lot of those in bulk, and you're eating more fruits and vegetables and spending less money on meat, you are, generally speaking, going to save some money by going plant-based, uh, even if it's one day a week, one dinner a week. And then lastly, uh, I touched a little bit on this before, um, for the animals, um, pretty simple concept, eating less meat, the animals suffer less. All right, I'm gonna pause for a second uh, just to make sure there are no questions before I go into the nutrition piece. Okay. Okay. All right. No questions. So I'm going to dive a little bit into nutrition. Um, there are a couple of uh, references that I'll show you at the end, as well as one here at the beginning um, about nutrition. So uh, just as a general overview, um, it is possible to get all the nutrition you need on a fully plant-based diet, as long as it's uh, carefully planned and you're thinking about uh, sources of protein and other things, and uh, really just uh, relying on whole foods. So first we have uh, protein. So protein is important for, uh, I think you most commonly hear muscle building and maintenance, although protein also does serve other functions in our bodies, but uh, mostly for muscle building, uh, especially as we uh, are growing in our teenager stage, we're still building that muscle. And then maintenance as we get older in our you know 30s or 40s, we do start to lose a little bit of muscle uh, every decade. And then as we get, uh, uh, a little bit older there, uh, we do tend to lose a little bit more muscle and it becomes a little bit uh, more difficult to maintain muscle if we're not getting enough protein. So uh, as a general rule, uh, it's about the requirement for protein is roughly, it's 0.4 to 0.5 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So as a rough estimate, uh, as a quick and kind of easy uh, way to estimate it is take your weight and divide it by two, and that would give you an approximation of how much protein you need per day in grams, uh, keeping in mind that it does vary slightly based on um, men tend to require a little bit more protein. Uh, if you're a little bit older, you may require a little bit more. Uh, if you're a little bit more active, a tiny bit more, but that's a good basis to start off of as far as an estimation. And then uh, protein foods. Uh, we do get protein from a variety of foods. Uh, so first of all, the foods that uh, are we consider a protein foods would be soy beans lentils nuts seeds um, and the handout that caitlin will link there in a minute um, includes a chart that lists a, a number of protein sources that are plant-based and that website is generally a good resource for a bunch of nutrition information regarding plant-based diets and i'll uh, show that website at the end as well uh, but we do get protein from a number of foods, um, not just the foods we consider in the protein group, but also from whole grains. Uh, things like oats and uh, quinoa are probably about 11 to 12 grams of protein per cup. And then uh, we do also get protein from a, tra in a trace amount from certain vegetables. So kale, spinach, uh, potatoes are also fairly high in protein uh, for vegetables. And in some cases, uh, you will see, uh, Meat and animal products do contain a little bit more protein than some of these products, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're not getting enough if we're eating these products. It's just that the average American diet right now, which is uh, centered on meat, uh, gets uh, includes a lot, a little bit more protein than we actually need. So even though we may get a little bit less on a plant-based diet, it doesn't necessarily mean we're deficient. Uh, it's just that diets that are heavy on meat uh, get more protein than they need, um, which you know it's not, it's not, it's not necessary. Right, uh, next nutrients uh, are calcium and vitamin D. So these are vital in a uh, number of functions, but mostly with bone health. Um, so preventing uh, things like osteoporosis, reducing our risk for hip fractures. And uh, this, 
these vitamins come into play or minerals come into play because when we think of calcium and vitamin D on a diet, uh, the word that comes up, uh, the food that comes to mind is generally dairy products. And so when we're on a plant-based diet, um, there's no dairy involved, but there are other ways to get your calcium and vitamin D. Um, with both those, uh, but with both those, you will typically find those in uh, non-dairy milks uh, because non-dairy milks are made to be a replacer for dairy milk. And so they'll fortify or uh, add back, add in um, the calcium and vitamin D, and it does vary by brand. So uh, make sure you check the label, the label on those to see. Uh, but most of your recognizable brands will be fortified with calcium and vitamin D, as well as um, other some other nutrients I'll mention later on. And then besides that, uh, tofu is a good source of calcium. Some tofu brands are also fortified with vitamin D. Leafy greens are a good source of calcium. So your kales and your spinach and your collard greens, uh, molasses. Um, I don't use that too much in my cooking, but that's a good source. Uh, orange juice is typically fortified with calcium as well uh, because the vitamin C in the orange juice actually helps uh, absorb, helps us absorb the calcium a little bit better. And then uh, some brands of cereals, again, um, they'll typically fortify cereals with calcium and vitamin D, especially cereals that are served to kids. Uh, and then another note with vitamin D, um, you won't see that in all of these foods, but vitamin D also comes from sunlight. So if we're getting enough sunlight, uh, you know, in the summer months, uh, that gives us vitamin D. Uh, you can also find it in uh, mushrooms, uh, mushrooms that are treated with UV light, uh, as well as some of these products. So the fortified products will typically have vitamin D added to them. Uh, next nutrient is iron. So um, iron uh, is a, plays an important role in preventing, uh, some of you may have heard the word um, anemia. So anemia is when we have low iron levels and that makes us feel very fatigued and tired. Uh, and iron plays a role in that because iron is uh, what carries the oxygen from our lungs to our, and it brings the oxygen to our cells to be used and turned into energy. Um, and so iron is very important and we do get a lot of it from uh, you know, our meat. And so when we're taking that out, we have to be a little bit careful about uh, getting enough of that to prevent anemia. Uh, but you do get it from a variety of sort of plant-based sources. So again, with the leafy greens, um, the kale and the spinach I talked about, tofu, you may find tofu fortified with iron and uh, also includes calcium. Uh, beans and lentils are a very good source of iron. Uh, fortified cereals, again, they add the iron to it. Uh, molasses, again, and then uh, whole grains, especially quinoa, have a fair amount of iron as well as nuts and dried fruits. Uh, so here we have pictured um, just some chickpeas here served on a sweet potato. And then here, is, this is a quinoa that I made for one of my classes uh, that I teach to the local co-op. Um, quinoa and it's cooked in uh, apple, apple juice, so it gives it some vitamin C. And it's sweeter and then there's some dried fruit in there. So that'd be a good overall source of iron that's very absorbable because the vitamin C from the apple juice helps us absorb the iron as well as the calcium. Uh, last nutrient I'm gonna discuss, uh, vitamin B12. So this is a very interesting vitamin um, because uh, it plays a vital role in energy metabolism as well as helping us form DNA uh, and make red blood cells. Uh, and the hard part with this is uh, vitamin B12 is mostly found in our diets uh, in animal products. And it's very hard to find them in plant-based products unless they're fortified. Uh, so fortified foods, uh, you'll see, I'll mention this uh, item later, but this is called nutritional yeast. And nutritional yeast is an inactive form of yeast uh, that you can find in, typically if you have a store, uh, you're close to a store with a bulk section, they'll almost always have nutritional yeast in either the smaller flakes or some larger granules. Uh, or you may find it in either uh, the uh, the health foods or organic section in a shaker bottle or in uh, like a Bob's Red Mill, if you're familiar with that brand, a little bag there. Uh, and what it is, is uh, it tastes very similar to cheese. And so uh, people who are on a plant-based diet will use it to replace cheese, either just by sprinkling it on top of things and adding a little bit more of a flavor or... Um, combining it with uh, other things like cashews to make cheese sauce or combining it with uh, almonds and, and pulsing it to make a uh, sort of a Parmesan cheese. 
Um, some people, even if they're not plant-based, it's pretty popular as a topping on popcorn. So popcorn with some oil and nutritional yeast to give that cheesy flavor without actually adding cheese. And that's a very good source of B12. Uh, and then uh, other sor sources of B12 would be, again, your non-dairy milks. Uh, you'll see some that are fortified with B12 because non-dairy milks are marketed at those uh, people who are plant-based or dairy-free and can't get the B12 from elsewhere. So they will fortify it because, you know, they know it's intended to be a replacement for milk. Uh, again, with cereals uh, are fortified. And then any sort of plant-based or vegan convenience product. So if you buy any of the um, plant-based meats or um, the frozen pizzas that are plant-based, those are typically uh, have the B12 added again because they're marketed to a specific plant-based population. And so they know um, that they're, that the sources of B12 are kind of rare, and so they'll fortify those products with the B12. And this is the one vitamin where, generally speaking, uh, most dietitians will recommend that you supplement with it because uh, just to play on the safe side, because B12 deficiency uh, can get pretty serious uh, as far as uh, developing um, fatigue and anemia. Um, and so just to be on the safe side, it's recommended that uh, supplementing, uh, depending on what the dosage you choose, either once to twice a week or a smaller dosage every single day. Um, and this is pretty simple to do because supplements for B12 are generally a little bit less expensive. And it's also very hard to um, overdose or uh, overconsume B12 because it's a water soluble vitamin. So any uh, B12 that you don't use, uh, your body will uh, it'll go right through you and you'll get rid of it. Uh, so there's really no risk of overdosing on B12. All right, we'll take another pause for questions. Yes, we do have a few questions. And um, I don't think that people will answer them. Okay. Repeat them okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first question is asked about how do you supplement if you have hunger after eating plant based meals or still being hungry after your vegetables? Yeah. Um, so that's one of those things where it depends on a lot on, uh, on what you're eating. Um, it's really uh, just a matter of uh, eating enough protein at the meal. So um, Make sure you're including some of those protein sources we talked about, beans, lentils, uh, nuts, whole grains, uh, and making sure you're combining um, those together. So um, we talked about protein earlier. Uh, and if you look at the handout that we referenced earlier, it talks about complete proteins. So combining uh, different sources of protein so that you get uh, all the essential amino acids um, that make a complete protein. Um, and then also just uh, eating in volume and then with the tough part with being plant-based is that initially um, you do have to find that you are hungry, which is, at least from my experience, and it's just, uh, it's really a matter of, um, sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay, so, uh, right, so uh, hunger pains, sometimes it's a matter of getting used to eating more or eating more often, and then um, getting used to adding protein sources and making sure you get those protein sources at each meal. And then the next question asks, um, and if you can repeat it, um, I'm hypoglycemic and find that I don't feel the same on all plant based meals. I've tried protein, but find that doesn't really doesn't adequate to meet my blood sugar. Any other advice? All right. Uh, so the question was, um, if you're hypoglycemic um, on a plant based diet, uh, finding yourself not being able to sustain that energy. Um, that's probably more of a question for a doctor because I'm not really sure the reasoning behind the hypoglycemia. But um, with most people who are hypoglycemic, it helps really to eat more often. So um, having more snacks available to prevent that blood sugar from going back down, um, and really uh, back to the protein uh, question, uh, back to the protein issue, getting enough protein at those meals um, to keep you fuller longer, and as well as uh, more fiber to keep you fuller longer. Thank you, Alice. And the next uh, yeah, so I'm pretty particular with my non-dairy milk. Um, my favorite brand is going absolutely going to be Silk. Um, I do like, uh, oh, sorry, the question was the non-dairy milks, which non-dairy milks I would suggest. Um, but yeah, Silk brand is my favorite, and they carry uh, soy milk. They carry almond milk. Um, I think they also do cashew milk and coconut milk um, in variety of flavors, and they do also have uh, in some sizes, a no sugar added version. So you're looking for something that's unsweetened, 
but they do also have vanilla and chocolate. Um, so that's my favorite brand. Um, some people also like, I think the other popular brand is uh, So Delicious, which I'm not a fan of, but some people do like. Um, there's also one newer brand called Good Karma, and that is a flax-based milk. So if you have allergies to soy or almond and other uh, those other typical plant-based milk, they do also have flaxseed milk available as the Good Karma brand, uh, and that's allergen-friendly. And all those brands also make things like uh, non-dairy yogurt, and some of them also make non-dairy ice cream and coffee creamer. So there's a variety of products out there to replace dairy. That's all the questions we have right now. Thank you. All right, uh, so this is the fun part. This is my favorite part of the presentation is where I show you food and talk about um, how I made it and some different ways to replace uh, to replace things you, like milk and eggs and uh, protein when we're cooking. But with protein, um, I've talked about protein before and there are a number of foods we can use to replace meat and other sources of protein. Um, one of them I list first, uh, beans and lentils. And I list that because it's an allergen friendly way to replace protein if you're allergic to any of uh, the other ones. So nuts or wheat or uh, soy slash tofu. Beans and lentils are very allergen friendly. Um, and here on this bottom uh, left picture, this is uh, the recipe that Caitlin will link here. Uh, it's a cranberry bean uh, meatball. And I tried this, what was this, about two weeks ago. And it's probably uh, the meatiest, I would say, meatball that I've uh, tried to make. Um, so it's made of black beans. And then to make it, to give it more texture, um, it's mixed with oats and then a little bit of flaxseed, or you can use nuts. Um, and then to flavor it, there's a cranberry sauce and then barbecue sauce over it, and also some liquid smoke uh, to give it a little bit of smoky flavor. Uh, so it's pr probably one of my favorite recipes now, and it's very simple. It takes about 20 to 25 minutes to bake, um, and very inexpensive too. Uh, so a great plant-based uh, recipe. Um, I've also used beans and lentils to make uh, meatloaf. Um, so something like this over here. Uh, I usually make a garbanzo bean loaf. So using chickpeas or garbanzo beans mixed with brown rice or oats and then tomato sauce uh, and then baked just like a meatloaf. Um, you, can use, um, you can do the same thing with lentils um, and also use these things for, uh, I use them to make dessert sometimes. So I puree them to make cookie dough. Um, I've done a number of things with beans and lentils, a uh, countless amount. Uh, so they're a very good protein source to use in a variety of things. And um, secondly would be nuts. So nuts, obviously not appropriate for those with allergies, but nuts are used sometimes, uh, you know, it'd be as simple as peanut butter sandwiches, or um, if you want to get creative, uh, nuts can be used to make um, pie crust. So mixing nuts with dates uh, makes a good uh, uh, raw pie crust. Or um, I've also seen things online that are, uh, it's like a taco meat, but instead of using uh, meat, uh, they use walnuts. So walnuts mixed with a number of spices and pulsed just, just barely so it resembles taco meat. So it's not pureed or like a walnut butter, but it's uh, almost crumbly like taco meat would be. And then uh, seitan, uh, which is a wheat-based meat substitute, and that can be purchased as a convenience product or you can use it, uh, you can buy something called Vital Wheat Gluten in the bulk section. And that's what I use to make these uh, ribs here. They're barbecue ribs and I used uh, Vital Wheat Gluten. And then I think it was some vegetable broth and then onion powder, garlic powder, uh, and then liquid smoke and then uh, barbecue sauce, just like you would with barbecue ribs. And the texture is very similar to what I remember barbecue ribs uh, to be. And then tempa is a soy based product. Uh, you can get it as uh, granules uh, to use to make like sloppy joe. And that's what we do on campus here. Or you can get them as strips. Uh, they sell tempa bacon and they sell tempa strips that you can marinate just like you would meat. And then tofu, uh, similarly, you can buy tofu and marinate it just like you would meat and grill it uh, just like you would meat or bake it and make it crispy. Uh, there are a variety of things. I'll mention tofu a little bit later on as an egg substitute too, um, but tofu can be used in a number of ways. And then uh, lastly, whole grains. So um, whole grains can be used as a substitute because they do contain protein. Uh, in this picture here on the top right, um, we use, this is something we use on campus. So it's a quinoa, uh, t again, taco meat, uh, quote unquote meat. And all we do is cook the quinoa and then season it just like taco meat. And it, resembles almost like the texture of a uh, ground beef wood because it's very fine and uh, granulated.
All right. Um, so next we have uh, milk and cheese. And this is probably personally for me the easiest one to give up because I've been lactose intolerant uh, pretty much since I was 18. Or at least I knew I was lactose intolerant since I was 18. Um, for some, milk and cheese is very hard to give up. Um, for milk, their substitution is pretty simple. Um, we mentioned non-dairy milks earlier. So there are a variety of those available, soy, nut, flax, hemp, coconut, um, rice, oat, uh, quite a few depending on what your preferences are and if you have any allergies. Um, I personally like soy milk. Um, it's a little bit higher in protein than most of your other non-dairy milk, so I do prefer it as with the taste and for the extra protein, um, but I also like nut milk. Um, and again, uh, be aware of added sugar with some of these because some brands the only variety available is a sweetened variety. Uh, things like rice and oat milk tend to be uh, highly sweetened and don't have a lot of nutrition in them and protein in them. Um, but soy, I like flax and nuts, I like a lot as well. Um, and it's just a one to one replacer when you're baking or using or making oatmeal or cereal, uh, simple swap uh, milk for non dairy milk uh, when you're cooking or baking. Uh, and then nutritional yeast we discussed earlier. So uh, as a replacement for cheese, you can replace it just, uh, you know, as a sprinkling on things, on pasta, or combining it with um, cashews. Um, I didn't link this recipe, but if you want it, I can definitely send it to you or show it to you later. This is a cashew-based cheese uh, from one of my favorite blogs that I'll reference later on. Uh, that's just cashews that are soaked and then blended together uh, to make creamy and then adding nutritional yeast um, to give it that cheesy color and uh, taste. Um, but if you are allergic to nuts, another uh, recipe for cheese uh, that can be used to make mac and cheese is uh, this other one that I have a link for coming up. It's a uh, cheese sauce, but the basis is allergen friendly. So it's uh, potatoes and carrots that are boiled and then uh, blended together to become creamy. And then after that, nutritional yeast is added. And then uh, I think this one has you know garlic powder, probably a little bit of turmeric you'll see in some recipes um, blended together and then added to cooked macaroni to make um, a cheesy mac and cheese and it's not quite as uh, creamy as the cashew cheese would because the cashew adds a lot of uh, fatty texture but it is still a pretty good basis for a cheese sauce is just potatoes and carrots and that recipe should be uh, in this list of links for the sweet potato or for the potato and carrot cheese sauce Right. And then as far as uh, the uh, hardest, probably the, the one that was hardest for me to give up was eggs. Um, so uh, with eggs, there are a number of things you can do. Uh, one would be using, if you're talking about eggs that we use for breakfast, like scrambled eggs, one would be using tofu. And uh, my favorite, I think if I had to pick my favorite uh, recipe blog is uh, this one coming up. Uh, it's called Minimalist Baker. And I have a link in the handout uh, that's uh, a scrambled tofu recipe. So it's a Southwest tofu scramble, and it uses tofu that's just broken up. And then they add nutritional yeast, uh, a little bit of turmeric. And then um, because tofu is very bland and uh, it absorbs flavors pretty well, you can add whatever spices you want to give it a little bit more flavor. And then it's just broken up into pieces, so it resembles almost like a scrambled egg texture. So that's a good replacer for some people for scrambled eggs and for breakfast. Uh, you could also use silken tofu, which is a different type of tofu that just has more water in it. And so it's a little bit softer. And this, this isn't the best picture, uh, but it's a quiche I made using silken tofu uh, as the as just the base. And there's a recipe in the links as well for this one. Um, and the crust here, I think, was potatoes, uh, just potatoes and some vegan butter. Uh, and then the last one I recommend for people who are al allergic to soy is chickpea flour. So chickpea flour, it can be a little bit hard to come by in some areas. Um, I find it in the bulk section at the co-op I live next to, uh, but you can also find it typically either in like a health food section um, or if there's an organic section or like a whole foods uh, section in your store. Um, Bob's Red Mill is another, another brand, a pretty popular brand. They, they sell it in their little tiny blag, uh, bags. And you can find it probably next to all of the specialty flowers if you have a section like that in your grocery store or get it online. Um, and you can also find it if you have an Indian grocery store next uh, where you live. It goes, at, it's also called uh, Besan, so B-E-S-A-N. Uh, so you see that in an Indian grocery store, that's the same as chickpea flour. 
uh, and it can be used. Uh, I there's a link in the handout that uh, uses chickpea flour to make these frittatas here, or there's another link that uses them to make omelets. So it's just um, chick chickpea flour and water, and I think nutritional yeast in there to give it some some cheesy flavor. And then it looks just like an omelet when you put it in a pan and cook it. Uh, and if you want to add a little bit more extra like eggy flavor, there is something called black salt that you can find again in Indian grocery stores uh, or online. It's either called black salt or um, the Indian name for it is, I'm probably going to butcher this, but uh, Kala Malak, so it's K-A-L-A, -A, I think it's M-A-L-A-K, uh, but it's black salt and you would replace any sort of salt in the recipe with just this black salt and it adds the sulfuric taste that eggs have and it makes it taste exactly like eggs. All right, and my personal favorite section is the dessert section. Um, and you can approach this uh, one, of, uh, one or two ways. Uh, so one approach would be to take a recipe that you already have that you like and replace the, the milk and eggs and the non-plant-based items, ingredients with some sort of substitute. And one of the handouts uh, that are included as part of this presentation includes a list that I put together of typical substitutes that you can use for butter and milk and eggs. And I've listed some in this uh, PowerPoint slide here. But uh, for butter, you can use, usually when baking, to replace butter with oil, unless it's something that really requires like a fatty, solid butter taste. Uh, oil works for the most case. Uh, my favorite replacement with chocolate recipes is to use an equal volume of mashed avocado. Because avocado is solid at room temperature, just like butter is. and um, it typically only works well with chocolate recipes because the chocolate will mask the color of the avocado uh, as well as the taste. But one to one ratio, one cup of butter is the same as one cup of mashed avocado and you use it just like you would uh, butter in a baking recipe. Um, in this recipe here, this is something I made up on my own. I took a recipe online that wasn't uh, plant-based to begin with, it called for butter. And all I did was take out the butter and I replaced it with mashed avocado. And this is a no-bake recipe, so it's a fudge recipe it's just avocado, uh, cocoa powder, and a peanut butter, and then maple syrup. And then I do some peanuts on top for garnish. So very simple, no-bake uh, vegan fudge recipe. Uh, applesauce also works pretty well as a butter replacement uh, in baked goods. But it, it is a liquid, so it only works well in things that are baked, not so well in things that would be no-bake like this fudge. Uh, and the milk, pretty simple. You know, if you have a recipe that calls for milk, simply switching for non-dairy milk, uh, any variety. I haven't really found that there's a difference between non-dairy milks when you're using them in baked goods. Um, and because the volume that's called for is typically like a cup, it's really doesn't really make a difference nutritionally to use any sort of uh, to focus specifically on one type. It's whatever you have on hand. And then eggs. There are a number of things uh, to use eggs for uh, or replace eggs with. Um, the one I probably use the most is using flaxseed. So uh, taking ground flaxseed, so one tablespoon of ground flaxseed, uh, throwing in three tablespoons of water, and then allowing that mixture to sit and gel for about 10 minutes. And you can do this with chia seeds as well. Um, the seeds will absorb the liquid, uh, and it will form a almost gel-like uh, substance after about 10 minutes, and that can be used to replace um, replace egg in any recipe. So that equals one egg. And then uh, something that's very popular in the plant-based community now is something called aquafaba. So aquafaba is literally translated uh, aqua, aqua meaning water and then faba meaning bean. So it's bean water. And aquafaba is, um, you can either get it from, uh, when you if you cook chickpeas or garbanzo beans from dried and have that cooking liquid left over, that's aquafaba. Or if you buy the canned version of beans, you can save that liquid that you typically would uh, drain out and toss and use that, and that's aquafaba. And so a tablespoon of that can replace an egg in a recipe. So it's just throwing it in to replace the egg and mixing it as uh, usual. And it mimics the same because there's a trace amount of protein in aquafaba. It has that same texture as an egg and it performs the same binding uh, function as an egg would in the baking recipe. Uh, and then a little side note about aquafaba, there are a number, because it's so big now, there are a number of cookbooks out there, there are about probably three, that are solely based on recipes that use aquafaba. Um, so uh, definitely look those up on Amazon. Um, 
you can also use aquafaba to whip. Uh, so if you whip it up with a little bit of cream of tartar and maple syrup, it makes almost like a, a marshmallow fluff. Or you could use that same fluff uh, to use as a frosting. Um, or you can even bake that fluff uh, into meringues, although it takes about two hours. Um, it is possible to turn that into meringues. And that's all it is, it's chickpea liquid, uh, no egg whites, and uh, sweetener for the most part. Uh, so that's kind of the one-to-one -one replacement. Uh, you can also just look up recipes that I already call for vegan, uh, vegan uh, plant-based uh, ingredients, and that's another route to do it. Uh, but I like to replace stuff in recipes I already have and see what happens and experiment. Uh, then with ice cream, uh, I would say vegan ice cream uh, is it's really hard to make on your own. Um, you can make it with coconut milk, cashew milk, rice milk, soy milk, uh, but it does often require ice cream make an ice cream maker. Uh, for like an easy, no fuss ice cream, I like to use uh, banana. So they call it banana and ice cream because it's a nicer version of ice cream that is a lot healthier than your typical uh, ice creams, either dairy or non-dairy ice creams. And uh, there's a link to the recipe, a recipe, a number of recipes in the handout there from one of my favorite dessert blogs uh, called Chocolate Covered Katie. And she does, she focuses mostly on desserts, but she does have some savory things as well. Uh, but banana and ice cream is um, bananas that are sliced up, so peel and sliced. And then the banana slices are frozen uh, on a cookie sheet. And then um, after the bananas are frozen, they're blended in a food processor, just pulsed slightly, not quite blended so it's pureed, but blended just so it's creamy and not uh, liquidy. And then you can blend that with whatever you have to flavor it. I did cocoa powder in this picture to make a chocolate ice cream. I've also done it with um, avocado to make it creamier. And then I've added a little bit of spinach to make it greener. And then I added mint, mint peppermint extract to make it like a mint chocolate uh, banana and ice cream. And um, you can eat it right after you make it. It's more of a soft serve. Or if you refreeze it, it'll become pretty hard. Um, it does harden pretty quickly. And so... If you do end up freezing it overnight after making it, it, you, it will take a little bit of time to thaw out to be enough to uh, to be uh, soft enough to eat because it is it does freeze pretty hard. And then you can also you know buy uh, again I, I mentioned the, some of the brands earlier Silk and So Delicious um, they both make uh, plant based ice creams usually made out of soy and cashew milk uh, and coconut milk. Um, you can also find rice milk ice cream, but that's not. It's not my favorite. It doesn't taste as great. Um, depending on where you live, uh, there is also um, a brand called Nautamu that I like a lot. It's coconut milk based ice cream. Um, and there's also one called uh, Cado, C-A-D-O. It's an avocado based ice cream, although they don't sell it in my area, so I haven't tried it. If you live on uh, closer to the East Coast, you may be able to find it. And then lastly here, we have a cashew based cheesecake. So there's a recipe for this from the same blog, Chocolate Covered Katie, in the handout. Um, I wish I could say I made this, um, but this is actually uh, from, so about a month ago, exactly a month ago, actually, was my birthday. And so uh, our uh, dining services uh, admin uh, professional uh, made me this cashew-based cheesecake uh, instead of a regular cake for my birthday. Uh, and it's just soaked cashews. Um, so you can buy a vegan cream cheese, but it's kind of expensive. So the inexpensive way to do it would be to take cashews, soak them to keep them, make them soft, and then it's blended together with maple syrup, um, sometimes uh, coconut oil or coconut cream to give it more of a solid texture, and then um, whatever flavorings, you know, berries, and that's put on usually a raw pie crust that's made of almonds and dates, and then uh, if you want it more solid, freeze that, and uh, it tastes just like cheesecake. Um, there is also, I forgot to mention, uh, lemon juice in this, or sometimes apple cider vinegar, and that gives it that tart taste uh, that a cheesecake usually has. Uh, and then I talked a little bit about these earlier, but if you're not really into cooking, I know not everyone cooks and not everyone likes to cook. Uh, so there are a number of store-bought items to help you transition into going plant-based. Um, faux meats I talked a little bit about. So uh, Gardein is the brand we use in the dining centers. Um, this is a Korean beef. And we all we do is usually replace the exact same recipe we have with meat and take out the meat and replace it with the same Gardein product. So they sell uh, chicken breasts, they sell beefless uh, strips, uh, fish fillets. Uh, I think they also do like nuggets, a variety of things, uh, burgers as well. Um, this brand down here is an up and coming brand called uh, Beyond Meat. 
So they have this something called the Beyond Burger, which is a plant-based uh, burger patty. But the idea was to mimic meat as close as possible, which isn't for everyone because some people, you know, are plant-based because they don't like the taste of meat. But if you are plant-based and you do miss the taste of meat, this is a good, uh, this is something I recommend trying out because it does taste just like what I remember meat is. And there's also no uh, allergens in this brand. So it's made of pea protein. So no soy or wheat uh, like Gardein. So it's allergen friendly, which is nice for some people. Uh, dairy free ice cream we talked about. There's a variety of brands of those. Uh, dairy free cheeses. Uh, we use a brand called Daya at one of our pizza stations. Um, tastes, uh, people like it a lot. And it's also pretty allergen friendly. It's not nut based. It's uh, coconut oil based. Uh, and then frozen pizzas, convenience meals, a lot of similar brands. Um, you can buy vegan eggs too. Uh, there's a brand called Follow Your Heart that sells a vegan egg. Also, um, there's a brand called Energy. So Energy um, without the Y, uh, N -E -N -E -R -G, G, uh, egg replacer for baking. Um, you can buy plant-based butters, um, Earth Balance or Smart Balance, and then a variety of cookies, cake mixes, uh, other sweet treats. Um, so you don't have to bake from scratch. Uh, the one caution with this would be costs. Um, so even though being plant-based, uh, generally speaking, is a lot less expensive, if you are relying on a number of these uh, faux meats or faux cheese substitutes, it can get pretty expensive. Uh, and some of these are also pretty high in sodium, so like faux meats, uh, so be aware of that. But it is a good way to you know, try new things. And if you're missing certain things in your diet, like meats and cheeses, it is fun to try out some of these things occasionally. So uh, lastly, just to get started, um, if you're fairly new to this idea of plant-based, um, it may be helpful uh, instead of going all at once to make small changes at a time. So maybe going meatless once a week. Uh, some people participate in meatless Mondays or being more reflexitarian where you're not eating meat. Let's say maybe you don't eat meat at home, but when you go out to restaurants, you eat, you'll eat meat. Um, something we do in the dining centers is less meat Mondays. So on Mondays, um, all the burgers we serve are a blended burger that's made with 25% mushrooms and 75% beef. So it's not a vegetarian burger by any means, but it's a little bit of less meat. And so it makes a little bit of impact as far as our uh, environmental impact as, and then also adds a little bit more nutrition to the burger. So small changes like that. Um, and there are a number of resources out there. I went to a variety of blogs uh, in, in those past links, uh, but these four resources are one of the, some of the best as far as repeatable resources that come from um, you know, peer-reviewed research. If you're looking for specific research on nutrition and plant-based diets, uh, this will give you pretty much everything you need. Um, the vegetarian resource group includes uh, things like meal plans and sample meal plans and um, list of items that have protein in them, list of foods that have calcium in them, uh, a list of food additives that may have animals in them, uh, books and recipes and uh, and then the next one is this dietitian practice group so this is a subgroup of the professional organization of dietitians that's focused on vegetarian nutrition and they address a lot of the common myths and they have a variety of consumer handouts that address you know can I get enough protein on a plant-based diet should I feed my child plant-based um, how do I get enough iron on a plant-based diet um, what if I'm pregnant and I'm plant-based, can I still do that? A variety of those uh, frequently asked questions when you're going plant-based and going through different life stages. They've got a handout for many of those. Uh, and then two dietitians that are very famous and specifically focused on plant-based eating are uh, the vegan RD, the vegan registered dietitian, and then the plant-powered dietitian. And both of the, uh, these dietitians typically will write uh, blogs on hot topics in plant-based eating or uh, dispelling myths and addressing uh, common concerns on plant-based eating. And um, so that leaves me a couple minutes for questions. Uh, my email is there as well as my Twitter, uh, which I don't, I'm not super active on, but I'll tweet every now and then. If you have any additional questions or want recipes uh, that I had reference to and maybe to include links for or other ideas for eating out uh, or eating plant-based in general. So, uh, any other additional questions? I saw a couple. I didn't quite read through them all. Yes. So one question is, do non-dairy yogurts still have good bacteria? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, 
most brands of non-dairy yogurts, because of the way they're made, will still include those pro probiotics because um, they can typically source those from an animal-free um, source. Um, so I, the one brand that comes to mind would be the Silk brand that I recently looked at, and they include the probiotics in most of their yogurts. Thank you. Our next question asks, can you cover anti-nutrients and how to better absorb minerals? Yeah, so um, anti-nutrients are, uh, at least from what I'm uh, understanding from the question, uh, and how they prevent mineral absorption are, uh, they're called, uh, they go under the name phytate sometimes. And so uh, let's take, for example, uh, kale. Kale contains calcium and iron, but they also contain something called uh, phytates, which prevent the absorption of calcium and iron, which is kind of counterintuitive. But when you cook the kale down, it actually breaks down some of those phytates uh, slash anti-nutrients and makes the calcium and iron more absorbable. So um, cooking things like beans and kale and spinach uh, breaks down those anti-nutrients and makes the minerals a little bit more easy to absorb. Uh, and the other way to make those minerals e easier to absorb with calcium and iron is to have those foods with vitamin C. So if you're uh, taking a calcium supplement or eating a salad, making sure to have an apple with it for vitamin C or some orange juice on the side to make it easier to absorb calcium and the iron. Um, the next question asks, I have tried going wheat-free and would like your opinion on health benefits or if it's just a fad. Uh, so a little bit of both. Um, wheat-free is definitely gluten-free for sure, not necessarily uh, uh, just wheat-free. So gluten-free was definitely a fad a couple of years ago. It's starting to die down a little bit now, um, but there are people who do need to be gluten-free uh, for because they're celiac or have some sort of intolerance. And some people find that um, they are they do feel, you know, they don't feel great when they're eating wheat, uh, especially large amounts of wheat. And so, um, but really for the general population, if you uh, aren't feeling any effects after eating wheat and you don't have a certain condition that that um, uh, makes you, uh, makes wheat ind indigestible to you, there's really no additional benefit to being wheat free. Thank you. Um, the next question asks, is coconut milk full fat dangerous because of so um, so the question was, is coconut milk dangerous because of the saturated fat? And that's a very hot topic right now in nutrition, whether or not coconut oil and coconut milk, um, the saturated fat is treated the same as saturated fat from meats. And um, really, for the time being, uh, I would say use coconut oil in moderation because it is still a saturated fat. And we knew, know for sure that saturated fat is related to higher cholesterol. So in moderation, for sure, with coconut oil. And then with coconut milk, it does still have the saturated fat if you use um, the canned coconut milk, which is usually the one you use for cooking, and that contains the, the fatty part of the coconut, which is the coconut cream. Um, but if you're using, if you're talking about coconut milk that's in the, the gallon size container that's used for drinking, that coconut milk is typically uh, a lot lower in saturated fat than the coconut, the culinary coconut milk you would buy in a can. And you can also buy uh, a light version of coconut milk that isn't have the full fat that has a lot of saturated fat removed. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, what do you recommend if someone has GI issues that they experience when eating like beans or legumes? And would combining dairy with lentils be a cause for discomfort or anything like that? Uh, so that's, um, uh, thanks for posing the questions in, in the comment box. Uh, so with beans and legumes, uh, it is pretty common to have uh, gas or bloating after eating them. and um, one tip is really, if you're new to plant-based eating, is to go a little bit slower on those at first. So um, starting with about a half a cup of beans and legumes is typically tolerable for people who are uh, who are on what's called a low FODMAP diet um, and building up your tolerance from there. And then the other one would be uh, when you're cooking them, if you're buying canned beans or legumes, being sure to rinse them really, really well, because um, that gets rid of a lot of the starch. And then if you're cooking it from scratch, um, being sure to soak them first uh, overnight and then in the morning rinsing them after you soak them and then uh, cooking them and then again rinsing them after you cook them. I've also heard, um, I haven't tried this before and I haven't really seen research, but I've also heard adding bay leaf when you cook the beans, uh, you reduce some of the cake, the gas in there. Um, again, haven't tried it, but I've heard that. Uh, and then with the second question, combining dairy with beans and lentils be a cause. Uh, I wouldn't say, 
combining it with the beans and lentils is the cause. I think it's just, it might be the dairy itself uh, being the cause of it um, because uh, typically as we get older, we're not able to digest lactose as well. Uh, and I know especially as someone who's Asian American, um, we tend not to digest lactose as well because uh, we don't grow up eating it as much as uh, typical people in America do. And so that might be an, uh, the primary underlying issue as opposed to the beans and lentils being the issue and combining those two. Um, so with yeast, uh, the nutritional yeast is an inactive form of yeast, so I'm not sure if that would pose the same. I'm not really sure about your specific allergy, um, but the nutritional yeast, because it's inactive, may be a little bit different from the yeast. It's very different because you can't really use it to, you know, bake bread. So it's a different form of yeast, and it may not cause those same allergies as the bacteria, the yeast you're talking about when it comes to baking bread with yeast. Uh, but as an alternative, if you don't want to use the nutritional yeast, um, there are, you know, non-dairy cheeses you can buy that are coconut oil based that don't use nutritional yeast or um, simply replacing, just leaving out the nutritional yeast when you're uh, using those same recipes. And for color, adding turmeric, you won't get quite the same taste or flavor, uh, but it, you can get the same color from using turmeric uh, to add that yellowish color. The next question asks, are vegan butters healthy and a good we were discussing uh, baking. Mm -hmm. uh, it really depends on uh, the brand. Um, some of them are still pretty high in uh, saturated fat and do use palm oil, which isn't really sustainable. So they're not the healthiest substitutes, uh, but they are uh, sometimes a little bit you know, tolerable as far as not having dairy in them. And then a little bit lower in fat, but again, I would use those in moderation. Oh, thank you. And our next question asks, um, at first, I would say again, it's uh, depending on where you where you're on the plant based spectrum. They it takes a while to really build up that tolerance to all the additional fiber, and so uh, initially you may experience that discomfort, and uh, with the gas as well, uh, initially you'll experience that. But you can uh, get yourself used to that and slowly build your way up there. And so uh, yes, at first for sure, uh, but you'll uh, at least for me, I got I got a little bit used to it over the years. Uh, so um, some of the blogs I mentioned, uh, minimalistbaker.com, uh, uh, so she has a very approachable style, so she calls herself plant-based but not necessarily vegan, um, and most of her recipes are geared towards uh, people who are new to plant-based and just want something that looks great and uh, mimics um, the meat and dairy counterparts of those recipes, so that's my favorite uh, blog. Um, there's a number of good blogs out there. If you would look at, um, there's a website called FindingVegan.com, so uh, Finding Vegan, and that is actually a compilation of different blogs that submit their photos uh, to the website for approval. And so there you'll find a number of vegan recipes, and I like searching through that because if I see a picture I like, I can just click on it, um, and it'll take me to that blog, and usually it's a blog. Sometimes it's a blog that I've never seen before, so um, it's called FindingVegan.com, and let me see if I can actually type that into the chat box. Minimalistbaker.com uh, is one. And then uh, findingvegan.com is the other one. Uh, i trying to think if there's anything else. There's a number of them for sure. Um, YouTube channels are also good. Um, I like a YouTube channel called Mary's Test Kitchen. Um, I can't really link it there to the YouTube channel, but it's called Mary's Test Kitchen. I'll just type up the name here. If you should go on YouTube and search it, uh, you can find it there. She has a lot of great recipes. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can think of that's on, off the top of my head. 